Coming up tonight on Game All Night, I'm joined by artist Brian Goldsberry. This Week and Each Week is brought to you by Game Toppers, LLC. Upgrade your gaming experience. Welcome to Game All Night. Hello and welcome to another game all night. I am your host, Chris Whiphan. With me always, usually, most of the time, is Dan the Bartender and Game Master Extraordinaire. How you doing down there, Mr. Dan? How are you doing, Chris? Oh, outstanding. We are uh, we're doing an unusual Friday night recording. There's no work tomorrow. So when we usually drink on the show, now we can really drink on the show. So I got myself a little Booker's Bourbon Neat, and I'm enjoying that. What are you enjoying, sir? Well, we have a theme we've established here, which is that tonight is a bourbon night. So I went with the uh, Beer Barrel Bourbon from New Holland, and, okay. uh, and it's going down real nice. Yeah, they um, good, good neat bourbon. So I, I think it's a definitely nice and tasty. So... Yeah, so tonight is really cool. This is a first on our show. We have, uh, we actually have um, an artist who works in the board game industry primarily. Um, obviously, if you're fans of the show, you know that Ryan Goldsberry does the artwork for the show, my character and things like that. I couldn't think of anybody better. He does this lovely piece. And actually, this piece is one of the ways we met was when we were at... Uh, packs you last year so i bought a couple of them off there so without further ado mr ryan goldsbury how are we doing today sir hey everyone doing uh, great friday That's afternoon outstanding <laughs> exactly right i mean it's friday what what can be worse about friday now of course when they're watching this it's thursday they still have to deal with another day you know so They'll be fine. They'll be fine. It's Friday somewhere, right? Australia. Exactly. Sure. <laughs> I'm not in Australia, but you know. Well, you're you're closer to it than I am, because because you're so. you're a West Coast boy at the moment, right? Right. Yep. In the Bay Area. Okay, San Francisco. I love it up there. Uh -huh. That's okay. nice. Yeah, the wife and I honeymooned up there. We um we actually spent some time at Disneyland. Drove up the PCH, spent a little time in Carmel, and then went up and uh, ran around the bay for a bit. I love it up there. It's gorgeous. I don't even like yeah. cities, and I like that. <laughs> Good city. Absolutely. Are you <laughs> drinking anything tonight? Uh, I've got nothing on me. It's a little early for me, and uh, I'm just sipping water. That's, That's all I've got. It's completely fine. There is no pressure for anybody to drink on this show, although it's always welcome. That, that much I will say. <laughs> So, so Ryan and I met, and one of the reasons why I'm kind of shocked that you're on actually on the West Coast is that you and I met at PAX U last year, which was held in Philadelphia, and right. you were there helping out uh, Tim Fowers at the booth, as I recall, which was directly across from Capstone, which is where I was. Yep. Yeah, that's right. And that was my first time being out there. Uh, I, I go to conventions to PAX or, or Gen Con with Tim fairly regularly but yeah that was okay. the first one first time i did that philadelphia yeah and uh when when you meet ryan in person he's very quiet and you're you're rather unassuming you're not like you're you're not like this recognizable person like to the point where i literally bought um the stills that i had the i guess they're lithographs and i bought them <laughs> off of you and then um a little bit later it dawned on me that wait a second <laughs> So I had to go back over with him. I'm like, can you sign these for me now? Now that I know that it's well, yours. <laughs> it's a weird situation to be in as an artist selling. Like, when you're selling something to someone, and they don't realize like you're the artist. What am I supposed to say? Like, hey, you know, I did that. Right. That's me. <laughs> right. So, you know, if you don't know that I'm the artist, you know, I'll just say enjoy and you know, maybe you'll figure out later on. Right. But it's also hard because, you know, Generally speaking, the art the artist isn't out there doing the interviews. They're not out there putting their faces on the back of boxes. You know, I don't I don't I couldn't pick like Clement Franz out of a, a lineup. Quanchai Moria, I could maybe 
maybe pick out. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, it's unfortunate, but I guess it's also good because you can be stealthy and just kind of fly below the radar, right? Below the radar, yep. <laughs> Story of my life, yep. I've done the opposite too, by the way. I have uh, at Comic Con have run up to uh, the booth of an artist that I'm a big fan of and right. gushed in their face before the guy said, "Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm helping out here. I uh, I'm a booth monkey. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take your money, but uh, that's not me." <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Comic Con's a little bit different too because there it's artists and they're actually you know they're there to see the artists. Right. You know, something like Pat, you're there maybe maybe to see some game designers. But uh, generally, you don't expect to see too many artists around. That's a shame if that's true. You, you know, I think so. It really is. And I think it's really interesting because, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I've only been gaming since uh, 2012, roughly. And mm -hmm. I even in the last, like, five years, I have seen a huge, like, kind of upswell where somebody will actually start to buy games just based on the artist and their involvement or the look and the feel that the artists are bringing to these things. I think it's, you know, it's can be just as important as a designer can be, you know? Yeah. And, and that's something I think uh, that Tim and I found out early on, it's a little like the icing on the cake, you know, I think mm -hmm. it brings people in. And I hear that more and more as, as I go to conventions as people saying, Oh, I walked up cause I liked the way it looked and, they like the way it looked and then they like the way, you know, the, the design is, right. you know, easy to sell. So it definitely brings people in. Yeah. And I think what's, I think it's very important because, you know, I, I can't imagine like a Tim Fowers production without your art in it now. Like it, it is that ingrained in how the look and the feel and the character. I mean, it also helps that there's, you know, with the fugitive and things like that, you kind of have an arc going with some consistent yeah. characters throughout. Right. You know, right. but it's, uh, it, it's that look and feel. Um, it, it, it's just as important. I think sometimes as the game design to have a consistent brand look and feel that kind of goes through everything. Does that make sense? It does. And, and that's something that just kind of came out naturally. You know, one of these days, Tim will, all, will will typically ask when we start something new, you know, do you want to try, we try a different style? Should we try and do something different? But I don't know, we always just kind of come back to using similar, you know, some of the same characters and similar style. But one of these days, one of these days we'll do something that's just totally different. Right. And I, <laughs> I just, I love that, you know, you work pretty much all digitally. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So it, I find it fascinating because, you know, I grew up before like digital art really came around to when I was because I was looking to go for graphic design when I was a kid and we were we were still using like Prismacolor pens and you still had to illustrate with markers and like that was the primary means. Um, mm -hmm. And they were teaching us to make separate plates for the different colors and it was a you know, so things are so much different. I think the creative space is huge, but I was never able to get outside of the basic media, like and into that space and make a watercolor that looks like yours do, for instance, on digital. Uh, it just amazes me. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. And I and I am influenced particularly by a lot of, you know, illustrators and animators in particular. Um, you know, I, I come from an animation background. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I worked in video games as an animator for about 15 years. And, and so that's really kind of what uh, inspired me and, and, you know, inspires my illustration. Right. Now, do, have you ever done any kind of um, cartoon illustrating or anything like that? Did you ever try to get into um, Disney properties or any of those kind of styles? Um, not really. I, I worked for just a, a short amount of time for, for Disney interactive, but okay. it was, you know, cartoony. It was, you know, it was Marvel, okay. you know, Marvel game sort of stuff. Um, but no, I never, I never did something, you know, I went to school and went through animate, you know, an animation program, mm -hmm. and, but got directly just immediately into video games and never really tried to get into film or animation. I'm, I don't even really know why I didn't push for that, but uh, I enjoyed making video games for 15 years and just never really switched out of it. It's very interesting because, um, you know, your style is very 
two dimensional. I mean, it's layered, but it's still, you know, very cell shaded, two dimensional kind of. At least that's the way it portrays in the um, the games I've seen that you've done, and I find that very interesting. Yeah. That you're you're, it's almost like it's a natural progression for you. It is. It really is. You know. I mean, like I said, my when I was going through school, I became just super inspired by a lot of the animators from like the 1950s. Right. Oh, at Disney, like Mary Blair and uh, Tom Orr. This is different animators and illustrators, and and mm-hmm. you can see a lot of influence on my stuff. Uh, and it's just it's the style I like to draw, and it's just fun for me. You know, I mean, if I can do, if I had to do more realistic, if I had to do, you know, just shaded and proper lighting and all this stuff, I could. <laughs> but it would be more it would be more of a chore for right. me a little bit. It's fun to just be loose and, and just be able to work on blocks of color and shapes and stuff like that. That's what I like to do. Well, I mean, it, it makes sense and you do it really well. And obviously, you know, I, I'm I, I don't want to say I'm biased, but I, I love the style enough that, you know, when I wanted to do this show, like I knew I wanted some pieces of art that kind of evoked like the 1950s talk show look and feel you know, skinny tie kind of look. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you, you were the first person I thought of and reached out to. And thankfully you said yes. And, you know, but it's just, it just kind of evokes that, that time and place. And it just does a great job. And I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, I, I hope so. So what is, that's what paying the bills these days. Is it just like board game art or are you doing other things? I, I do other things. I'm not to the point where it's just board game art yet. Uh, okay. I, like when I started out just working with Tim Fowers mm-hmm. and uh, we made our first couple of games, Paperback and Burgle Brothers. And uh, after that, Tim was able to kind of go full time. And uh, I was I was this close to going full time. <laughs> with him, but it was it, it would have involved me moving <laughs> from uh. California, which we haven't been able to psych ourselves up enough to do yet and uh so i but i did leave the games industry uh, a couple years ago and okay there's a local it's kind of funny but there's a (laughs) a lab a government lab lawrence livermore lab which is like this nuclear lab it's in my town (laughs) and like this department of animators and illustrators and i had a buddy working there and he was like hey you should just come here there's be no commute and you know, the scheduling there is much easier. So I, I work there. It's kind of my main day job. I work there about four days a week. Okay. And then I do the board game stuff along with that. So um, what, what kind of things are you animating there? I hope it's not like duck and cover videos that are just kind of redone, right? <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's it's interesting. I mean, it's it's crazy. And there's so, you know, I mean, obviously there's hundreds of scientists that work there. They work on all kinds of stuff, everything from, you know, nuclear weapons to you know to car batteries and, and right. global warming and all that kind of stuff and <laughs> this one ever just you know how to destroy the world and how to save it at the same time they're, they're covering it all but they <laughs> ever a scientist needs you know some kind of visualization whether it's an animation or an illustration okay to kind of illustrate what they're working on they'll come to our department you know it could be the you know, they have to show something to the government or they're going to be published in a magazine and they want a cool illustration. Uh, it's all that kind of stuff. Interesting. So, so that, that's got to be tough at the same time because you're taking some pretty high concepts and trying to make them relatable, understandable and digestible, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And it is tough. And one of the toughest things sometimes is, is talking to the scientists themselves because they'll sit down and they'll start explaining the science of this stuff, which is a mile above my head, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we'll sit there and just kind of nod and oh, we get it, we get it. And then finally we'll just have a second. Okay, now what, what does that look like? Like what, what right. color are we talking about here? What is the shape? What, what exactly just think purely visually. And let's discuss that. Um, so that's the hardest part is probably getting the scientists to come out of their science area and just think visually and, and try and explain it to us. Interesting. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's funny that you wouldn't think that there are needs for that. But then, you know, I'm working for a restaurant company and I'm doing all kinds of like 
graphic design work and I'm like, I'm just trying to make instructional things. Then all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're you're creating different, you know, pieces of art and assets and everything else that go with it. And it's just like it's it's kind of a, a lot to do with those small little training things sometimes. Right. <laughs> yeah, it can be. And, you know, they, they give you a little bit of, of uh, you know, leeway to kind of work on your own things. Um, mm -hmm. Shortly after I got there, I, I did just kind of on my own time or just I had some downtime there at the lab and I, I did a poster kind of styled after like, you know, like the early 1900s travel posters. OK. And I did it based around one of their buildings, which is one of these buildings where they they blow stuff up. Literally, they do all these things. <laughs> And uh, and so, you know, they have this cool chamber and I did this cool, this kind of stylized, you know, trap. If you're familiar, if you're familiar with travel posters, mm -hmm. um, the older ones, it's kind of in that style and just for fun. And I had it printed there. And uh, one of the guys kind of higher up saw it and then they commissioned like five more from, oh, wow. for different. Areas so it was cool. It was kind of cool to see, you know, be able to put my style, the kind of style that I like and say, you know, you guys want more of this? And they did. It was cool. Now, is that the kind that had like the the large text over that kind of went over the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it would be like, you know, for like the tagline, the building is called uh, Heath, like the high explosives application facility. Okay. And, you know, so we throw that on. The, I threw that on the top and then the little tagline on the bottom. It said, when you just have to blow stuff up, you know, come visit. <laughs> um, so it was kind of cool. It's kind of fun. That's awesome. But it, you know, it still allows you to kind of get that creative outlet out and let you play outside the normal stuff, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Now, I was also curious because I think a lot of people might not understand all the, the nuance that goes into game production because, you know, you have a you have artists and then you also have the people who are producing the game and directing it, but then you also have illustrators and graphic designers. So you can have right. like a, a large team working on a on a certain project and they might not always get along. I guess you haven't really run into that though yet, have you? No, you know, for I I have done most you know, like I said, when when Tim and I started this with paperback, mm -hmm. it was totally learning experience you know okay. and, and i i really hadn't done a whole lot of illustration and i really hadn't done any graphic design okay. and so we were sort of fumbling through it you know literally it was just you know the printer would come back and say oh we need x or we need this or we need this <laughs> we need these oh, yeah, plates and the, yeah <laughs> right so i guess we'll make something for that uh you know later on you know we occasionally we get outside help uh we we have uh, one or two people that uh and some of the some graphic designers that we've had help a little bit uh but generally i i will handle most of the graphic design and illustration um just myself so no there's not a lot of argument and tim is you know I, I, tim and i we trust each other quite a bit uh and he's very laid back and i'm super laid back and so we just you know <laughs> we just kind of fumble through it and and get it done you know right and it's um it's really interesting because you know the the jobs can be very unique like an artist can be more of almost like i guess like a background artist like it can be the look and feel it can be the the big sweeping box image and maybe some of the the signature pieces or the board and then you also have like the illustrator who might be doing all the card art the iconography and all that stuff and then the graphic designer is kind of i guess he's pretty much making it usable from that standpoint like that it's functional and that it all kind of makes sense within the game system itself is that a fair breakdown of jobs yeah i mean when, when i think of graphic design i think of how stuff is laid out on the card so that you right. can understand it think of things like uh you know text you know what what kind of fonts or text you're using i think of things you know like uh a lot of times just little you know if you have little icons little symbols or stuff that's right. going to be on the cards uh you know they handle a lot of that kind of stuff hmm. uh and that's and that's been stuff that i had i've had to learn myself you know again i wasn't trained as a graphic designer i'm not right. really a graphic designer but it's just you know I, I end up just doing it anyways right they're the and they're the people who really have to understand then the 
the production and the print side of things because when we start to get into four color press and CMYK distributions and bleeds and mats and it's just like wait right. I just want to paint pictures. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had I mean I had we had no idea about any of that stuff. Our first couple of games, you know, literally we were just throwing art at the, you know, at the manufacturer saying here it is, and they would say, well, you need bleed on that, and you need all this, and what does what does that mean? What how much? You know, yeah. So it, it's, learning. Yeah, and it's definitely crazy. And I think that, you know, a lot of people don't give a lot of credit to those things. And I think, you know, sometimes we can complain about iconography in some games and things because there might be too much or it's very abstract. And a lot of people feel the need to redraw icons that may already exist or that there's kind of standards for like a discard a card from your hand or, you know, all those silly little icons that we might encounter 10 times in different games, but everybody wants to put their own spin. But I think we have to re recognize that it's, it's an art style that somebody might be going for or look and feel. And then they also might have to try and make it work in 40 different languages at the same time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we, we just ran into that recently with uh, a lot of our older stuff, a lot of okay. our Burger Brothers. You know, and uh, you know, we were doing what a, a German translation recently, and uh, mm -hmm. the guys over there were were contacting me, saying, you know, do you have these files? Do you have do you have the files with with the fonts still in them intact, and the layers and stuff like that? And back back then, you know, in paperback right. and Burger Brothers, I I didn't really know what I was doing, so no, I didn't even have proper files. I had to kind of go recreate a lot of stuff wow. so that they could do you know a good translation of it. So. Interesting. It's like things, things you don't think to prepare for is, you know, how to how to keep all these different files organized and how right. people expect yeah. to receive them. No, that makes a lot of sense. And then, of course, what happens if the font you're using is not available in a language and it doesn't have an umlaut and now all of a sudden you can't use it or it's. Right. Yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of um, interesting things that happen. And I think that that's why you see a lot of companies that want to do, you know, as little text on cards as possible because it, it's a lot easier to kind of iterate across the languages. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. You know, Fugitive that we made was, was beautiful for this. I mean, we mm -hmm. even recently did a Korean translation of that. I mean, you, we could do anything with that because there's no text. I mean, the card is just numbers. Right. And that's all there is. Perfect. Yeah. And all you have is maybe the, um, I forget what they're called now. But they're the the cards with the little banded symbol on them that might crop oh, up. Right. They might crop up occasionally, but there's there's not a ton of them, and they're not used all the time. So that makes a lot of sense, yeah. which is different, I guess, than paperback or hardback because now you're talking in a literal English-based game that is based right. around the English language. To to reprint that in something else, I guess, might be a completely different challenge altogether. Yeah, it's a beast. And we do have different language translations of those games. But now you have to, you know, like for French or for, for you know, Spanish, you have to weigh how many letters of each card you have. You know, like right. we have a certain amount of each letter per card, but and that's based on the ratios that are in English. But then there's different ratios of what, how many, you know, letters mm. are you, how often letters are used for different languages. Right. And we have to change some of those letters. Do you, do you um, cheat so yeah. and go look at Scrabble boards in different languages to see what they rate yeah. it? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I personally didn't. Tim may have done that. There. <laughs> we, we've, been lucky to have, we've been lucky to have just a lot of people that you know are willing to help with translation. Right. I mean, when you start to have a successful game, you'll get people to come out and say, you know, I'll help you out with your Spanish translation if you want or your French. And it's awesome. You know, the, the community is really helpful. Absolutely. Now, have you had a chance to work on any projects that have been like, you know, outside of Tim Fowers games? Have you started to seek work that, you know, isn't just with him? Um, I, I haven't had much time to do that. Okay. Tim keeps me very busy. I do work with. Uh, <laughs> That's how he keeps I you do. to himself. He keeps you busy. <laughs> right. If he's throwing stuff at me. Whether, you know, when we do, we've done games, we've done digital, you know, uh, app versions of a couple of our games. Those will keep me busy. But I have done a couple of games now with Jeff Beck, who was also kind of partnered up with Tim a little bit. If you're familiar with mm -hmm. uh, Word Domination, or we just, we just, uh, and he was one of the designers on Hardback as well. Right. 
but uh, we recently kickstarted his uh, Getaway Driver game. Uh, that's a Jeff Beck game. So I do his art as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and but, I think that one, uh, Getaway Driver, just ended, if I'm not mistaken, correct, at the time? Yeah, it ended, it ended a few weeks ago. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I know. I was definitely in on that one because that looks like a lot of fun. And that kind of kind of keeps that fugitive line going, doesn't it, a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't exactly know how the conversation went, but I think at one point Jeff actually had – a different character, you know, was coming up with different characters for these and then just, just, you know, decided, Hey, why don't we just use, you know, some of the Burgle brothers characters in there? Cause you know, they're already established and you know, we like them. So we did or The main character is a, a juicer from Burgle brothers. So, so then they're kind of, and then we have obviously the fugitive is another one that's kind of based on the Burgle bros. So it's basically, they all got out of the building and they're all starting to tell their own different story now exactly that's that's exactly how it's kind of worked out and it's fun it's fun to take these characters and just put them in different scenarios and you know kind of create your own little fictional world there with, with these guys it's cool i like it have you ever had um anybody like want to do like books or cartoons based on some of the the campy book titles from page turner from some of the other episodes <laughs> at all or has anything sprung from those <laughs> no not yet but that would be awesome i would love to do you know, some kind of comic book with one of those would be sweet. Now, are you responsible for any of those puns at all with the page? Um, or is that yeah. mostly Tim? Uh, it's about half and half. Okay. I'll always, throw, I'll always throw one on there and then Tim mm -hmm. will either say I like it or, hey, here's another idea. So it's about half and half. It reminds me very clearly of a poster that was in my high school that was, um, I forget what the name, it was, it was, a movie poster in that exact style and it was like you know starring Stu dent and rita chapter it was yeah. it was the yeah. almost exact same aesthetic and it's hysterical i it instantly gravitated to the game based on that experience alone i think <laughs> yeah yeah and and those i love i love that that whole style that whole genre of those paperback you know those pulp paperback art is so cool so fun to look at Absolutely. So this has been a lot of fun. I think we should take a quick little break because I want to get in and what you're doing these days, because I have a feeling that you, you're not, if you're busy, that you have projects going on. So I think we need to kind of explore that a little bit. How does that sound? Let's do it. Sounds good. All right. So we're going to go to a commercial break and we'll be right back after this. GAN presents... Dramatic Rules Theater. You are a king, seeking new land to expand your kingdom. You must explore different terrains, from fields, lakes, mountains, villages, forests, and gardens in order to develop the best territories. But be careful, other kings are also coveting these lands. Note, before your first game, assemble all the four small castles. The object is to build your kingdom in a 5x5 five five grid by connecting dominoes with matching terrains. The more matching terrain you have, the more crowns there are, the more points you have. All right, welcome back. I'm still with Brian Goldsberry of, well, I guess you're of your own volition but you do a lot of tim fowers games and mm -hmm. we just recently got done talking about the jeff beck game getaway driver yeah. and car mm -hmm. chases and we were talking in the break and i think that this was this was kind of cool so i think maybe we could go into it um sure. some of the challenges we have i mean we talk about how it might be easy for somebody to say well my buddy can draw so I'm going to have him do some artwork and then I'll scan it in and we'll put it on cards. Um, but cards are kind of hard to work with, I think, if you're really thinking about how a card is, because cards are go against our nature. They're they're vertical. We tend to only get to see a portion of it at a time. So how challenging is that to try and design a game that can be visually appealing and natural to our eyes because our eyes want to 
we want to divide things in thirds and, you know, follow the golden ratio. Look it up, kids. It'll help you take better pictures. You know, we want to do our eyes want to do that for us. But then a card is trying to mess with that a little bit, I think, in a lot of cases. How do you handle that from an artist standpoint? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, we're I, I think that as a people, we're, we're comfortable looking at something that's vertical. I mean, we look at photographs and, you know, we all have our phones mm -hmm. and we're taking photographs generally vertically. Um, so, so we're familiar with that. So, so basically it's, it's mainly just laying it out on the card in a way that is more the, the most user friendly, you know, like okay. you said, like if you're holding your cards together, what part of the card do you see? What part of the card do you need to see? So if you have information that's important, does it need to be, in the top left so that it's always readable it doesn't need to be in the bottom so that you always know you know if you have the cards laid out on the table or something it just you know those little graphic design things you really have to think about uh and then with our cards a lot of our cards are just are 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 heavily illustrated if that's right the way to put it. Like, look at fugitive you know each one is an illustration and there the main constraint is just the size you know okay. uh it's it's thinking about how much story and how much character or personality can I fit in a two and a half by three and a half card, you know, that's going to have some, you know, the fugitive cards have a little bit of graphic design, but just a tiny bit. So I do have most of the card to work with there, which is awesome, but it is still small. I and mean, you have to make sure, you know, as I'm, I'm sitting there painting on my, on my computer, you know, with my tablet and, you know, I've got my screen full of the image and I think <laughs> it looks great. And I have to remember to make it small, you know, right. is, does, right does it make, scale? <laughs> right. Does it scale? You know, I mean, and does it matter that I'm adding all this detail in, you know, that, that you're not even going to see when it's printed on the card? I, I do that a lot. I add way more detail than is probably needed uh, for something so small. But I think um, that that's good because it allows you to use those images later if you want to, you know, enlarge them or do something like, you know, it, Tim wants, a, you know, a banner at the booth. You have artwork that's detailed enough to handle that at the same time yeah absolutely and that is something i keep in mind too you know when i when i create an image mm -hmm. you know in photoshop that i'm using i don't just make it two and a half by three and a half at 300 dpi and call it good and start painting on it i'll make it huge uh yeah. you know huge resolution so that i can i can do stuff like that i can make prints or i can we can make a banner or a poster or whatever with it uh, without yeah. losing any of the resolution yeah, and I think, you know, especially when you're working in something that's, I mean, we're, we're going to get a little techie here. Sorry, sorry, people, if we lose you. But when you're using a raster-based system like Photoshop, you don't have the scalability that you have with a vector-based system like an Illustrator, where that's designed to go as large or as small as you want, whereas Photoshop really counts on dots being in place, right? It does. And I just my my own personal art style. I can't do it in just Illustrator no. because it all has kind of a painterly texture to it. So it has to be raster based. You know, I do it in Photoshop, so I have to be very conscious that I am making it big enough, a large enough resolution that it can we can do whatever we want with it. I think that that anybody who's working with the kind of paintbrush, um, you know, the watercolor techniques that seem to proliferate throughout your style that that has to be pixel based because you want that various depths and that texture that you get and you can't get that without an, an inordinate amount of work in the illustrator side of things yeah illustrator is just too hard to get the look that i would want personally yeah so sometimes i will sometimes i will go do kind of the base illustration in illustrator but then i'll have to bring it over to photoshop to then you know mess it up make it make it look you know, more like a painting. So kind of like a traditional comic book st or shell shading style where you you do the main image in Illustrator and then kind of paint on it in Photoshop right. to kind of get the detail work. Right. That, I do that, that often. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And then you, at least the core artwork is always scalable at the same time. It is. I, I, yeah. If that were, I, still, I still make it big so I don't have to go back to the Illustrator sure. style. But yeah. Sure. There. Awesome. So let's say Tim has the, the next game in the line. And I, not that I, I know anything, but I'm sure there's, there's, there's many characters in Burgle Bros and ladies that need to come out and, and find new games for them. So let's say he's handing you a new game. What is, 
what's the first thing you want to get to work on and what's the piece that you love to work on the most? Um, so I really, I really like character work. I love designing characters and drawing mm -hmm. characters. So, uh, you know, I'll typically ask, you know, if he says we're going to do a new game, like for instance, we, uh, Sabotage is a game we have on Kickstarter right now. And it's, you know, at kind of another in the universe of Burgo Bros. Okay. And, and so with that, he came to me and he said, well, you know, I do want to use a handful of characters from uh, Burgo Bros. But then, you know, my next question will be, well, can, are, there, are there other characters that I can design? Said, yeah, we do have, we have, you know, four more villains that are going to be in this. Go crazy. What, what do you think? Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably my favorite part. I love designing characters. But, you know, typically after characters, he'll, he'll want kind of the main box art. Which which will be typically the main piece, you know. Okay. So that'll be the next and that, those are always super fun to do as well. That's just you know an illustration. I mean, just now, does down. the box art really does that kind of serve as the the overall graphic theme that kind of you work on from there? Does it kind of serve as the the master document style guide, whatever we want to call it, of the rest of the artwork for the uh, the game that might come after, or at least inspiration, I guess. Yeah, for me, it definitely does. You know, that's it's the piece I'll do. Sometimes with a couple of the games, you know, early on, I will do, you know, what, I, what I'll call just like a, a key right. piece of art, a key art that may not even end up being on the box, mm -hmm. but it's just kind of has the characters in it. It has a style that I think is going to go for it. Um, and, you know, we use that as kind of the main promotional thing up front, too. But it doesn't always end up being the box art. Right. Because um, it doesn't work for that but uh you know it's just something we do early on that can kind of get me in the mode nice so the other thing is is that what i find very cool is that when i found that you sold the prints at the show that was pretty awesome um and given that my wife and i are scuba divers that's why the in too deep one had to come out and grace yeah. our house um i knew instantly that that was going to be one um but then the other thing that was cool was I was looking through and I'm like, you know, I, I really love the art from The Fugitive and I love some of the chase scenes that you did because they were heavily inspired by some movie chases, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, there's definitely some bullet in there. Yeah, in there's there. definitely a bullet. There's a little bit of, uh, you know, that, that scene in the French connection where he's chasing after the train. Right. Uh, and, you know, I mean, there's even a little bit of Fugitive in there, the movie Fugitive. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, I we definitely try and, and choose what is going to inspire it. So the Fugitive, it was, you know, we looked at movies, we looked at car chases. Mm -hmm. We're looking at a ton of car chases for this getaway driver game of Jeff's, you know. But then again, for paperback, it was me just looking through hundreds of, of uh, you know, pulp novel covers. Right. And, and old science fiction magazine covers and stuff like that and kind of get inspired by those things. Right. And I think that it's, uh, it's really, I don't know. I just, I love that they have this kind of authenticity because your, your brain goes, that looks familiar. You know, like I, like the, the Mustang jumping over in San Francisco, which now I get even has a little more personal, personal history for you living in the Bay area there. Um, but you know, it's just like it, the visual appeal is great. And to the point, like, I'm like, wow, I really love these. I wish you had a print with all of them on it. And you're like, I can do that. Next thing I know, I get an email saying that, you know, there's one in the Etsy store if I want to go pick it up. So it was, uh, <laughs> it's nice to know that, you know, as an artist, you're very approachable and, and it's, uh, you know, I think you just love to get your stuff out there and when people appreciate it and, it's good for us to feel that we have that connection, I think, at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, I just it's it's cool for me. I love going to the conferences, the conventions right. like PAX. And, and I just it's it's awesome to just talk with people. And, and they'll you know, the reason I did prints in the first place was just because people said, you know, man, I would I would buy that as a as a print. You have that as a print or a poster somewhere. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just nice to talk to people and kind of hear what they want and, and you know, try and meet that. I love it. And it, it sits right above my board game table. I have several pieces and um, some of my, my favorite things. And it's, uh, 
I don't think I have anybody else's art um, sitting over there now that I'm thinking about it. Maybe my own. That's about it. But <laughs> I call it more crafty stuff. So you did mention yeah. that you had sabotage out there. So so what was the um, so what's the uh, the deal with that? Because that's live on Kickstarter. I'm not sure exactly when this is going to air. That might have just ended or just about to end. It's right around there. Yeah, it's uh, I think by the time this airs, it'll probably have ended. I think so. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's just, you know, it's Tim's new game and it's kind of a unique game for him. Mm -hmm. Much more, uh, you know, we call it more of a gamery game. It's a little, <laughs> little more involved. Uh, you know, it's a two, it's, it's a two versus two asymmetrical sort of game. One, one half, one side is the villains. One side is, okay. you know, the, the, the people that are trying to infiltrate and sabotage the villains doomsday weapon, mm. you know, that's going to the world and it's a lot like it's a lot like uh you know battleship in a way in that you have kind of a barrier okay. between you you have that you're looking at and basically you're trying to find where you think uh, if you're playing is if you're playing as the infiltrators mm -hmm. which are the burgle brothers characters you're trying to find where that doomsday weapon is and you're, <laughs> you're just trying to find you know the burgle bros and take them out and uh, you know you're programming in moves and stuff but it's it's uh uh, you know, the art style is kind of in line with Burgo Brothers. Uh, you know, we want it to be very, you know, angular and very, you know, mid 1900s looking. Okay. And, uh, so it'll be cool. I, I think I'm excited when you, the box, it's kind of cool. Tim thought this out. The box kind of unfolds. Interesting. And it's going to, it's going to be the barrier between the two teams. And there's going to be a ton of art on this box by the time it's done. It's going to have kind of a, an, an entire scene where you can kind of see, you know, the lair that you're infiltrating and, and the different rooms in the lair. Excellent. And one side can kind of look like a control panel if you're, you know. Uh, so it'll be cool looking. I'm, I'm excited about it. I guess that's got to be a lot of fun to work on because that's, you know, a lot bigger than your normal palette that you get to play on. Right. It's, <laughs> it, it's, it's a bigger box too, which is a, a, a unique thing for Tim. Who always has these tiny little yeah. boxes that people love or hate. But this one is, you know, going to be a big full size, you know, 12 by 12 inch box. And so it gives me a lot of space. Mess around I, with. I, I fall in the love category. If for no other reason, then there is not a wasted millimeter of space inside Burgle Bros. It fits like perfectly. I love that. Oh, yeah. It, love it's, it. uh, you got to be precise putting it back together. <laughs> <laughs> the next 10 minutes trying to get it back in that box. But yeah, some people love that. Some people. We've had people complain, so they hate it, but, you know. Now, you now the people who go out and say, well, yeah, the box isn't big enough because I went and bought the tower off of Broken Token or whoever made it that has all the different floors on it that makes it even more fun. I made my own out of foam core because I'm like, I wanted <laughs> to play that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, I totally get that. Mm -hmm. So what kind of um, advice would you give to somebody who – want has a game we're sitting in this state of i have a game in mind and i'd really like to you know get some art pieces for it maybe not a ton you know they're they might be on a shoestring budget um as most of us are so what kind of advice would you say to them coming to you as an artist what should you what do you need from them what what should they expect you know what are some pieces that they can take away? Um, oh, so this, this is a little tricky for me because I haven't worked with too many other people. Okay. Um, it's, it's tough. It's tough if you don't have a budget. Mm -hmm. um, it's good if you can at least start off with something and say, you know, I've got X amount of money. Can you do a cover? Let's start off right. with the cover. Something that I can, you know, show whether I'm going to kickstart this or whatever, you know, that I can mm. show on there and, that, you know, this is going to have art and it's going to look kind of like this. Um, but, uh, you know, generally if, if you're going to Kickstarter and again, that's my only experience is going to Kickstarter with right. these things. Um, you know, when, whether I'm working with Tim or Jeff, we never have all of our art finished, not even close. Uh, you know, like I said, we generally have a cover, uh, I'll have a couple of characters, maybe an example of a card or something like that. Okay. So you know, figure out what your 
what your minimum amount of art is that you think you can get away with showing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, you know, most illustrators, as far as I understand it, you know, you know, we'll probably, you will probably need to be paid as opposed to, <laughs> as opposed to, yeah. as opposed to saying, well, you take a percentage or, uh, you know, when I, when I work with Tim, it's a little different. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually just take a, a percentage and, and we just kind of do rev share. Okay. Um, but, but that's because we have a very close relationship and we've known each other for, for decades. Right. And so, we, uh, you know, trust each other and work that way. But, uh, you know, that's, that's tricky if you don't really know the person. Right. It and makes not, sense. And, and you don't, you don't have the trust. You know, I typically trust that Tim's games are going to be awesome games. Mm -hmm. And I trust that, you know, they're going to fund on Kickstarter and, and they're going to be successful. And so I'm, I'm happy to say, you know, yeah, we'll just, we'll stick with our percentage, you know, and, uh, We'll, we'll go with that. But uh, typically, if you're just approaching an artist and you don't know him and he doesn't know you, right? Uh, you'll probably have to, you know, work out some money. What would you want from um, a direction standpoint? Let's say they they need a box cover. They'd like a couple samples of cards and things that might be in the game. Maybe maybe a board mock up or something like that. What kind of art direction are you looking for? Um, or what kind of materials do you need to make good decisions for them? Because you want to make sure that it's a good fit for the client, I would guess. It's not just a, right. maybe my style doesn't, isn't going to work for your game, you know? So yeah. the, the best, the best question to, an, to, to ask for that, you know, if, if someone approaching me, I would say, okay, you've seen my art. What, what is it in my art that you like? Like show me some, mm -hmm. show me some pieces, my art that you like the most that you think, oh yeah, I want something like that. Uh, but okay. you know, obviously, the game. Um, and if if that doesn't exist, then I I wouldn't mind seeing some art that you do like. Uh, you know, like oh, I I really love you know this particular style. Here's some pieces. Because I may at that point be able to say, well, I don't want to do that. That's you know that's not really a style that I'm interested right. in doing. Or you know, but but typically, just you've seen my stuff and you know what I do. Show me what you like, and then we can discuss how it can fit your game. Uh, is, is kind of the main question. Do you think you'd need anything like um, a rules breakdown? Do you want to know how the game itself is going to play? Is that like I, I'm, I'm thinking from a designer standpoint like that that to me has been my life for the last like two to four years has been building this rule book and trying to build this game. You know, does that how far do you think does that play into, you know, your your decisions in your direction? For me personally, uh, heavily. I, I don't think that I would take uh, a game from someone or, you know, right. agree to do a game from someone unless I had either played it with them or they had really walked me through it okay. so that I understood it. I mean, I mean, I don't, you know, not to be like a jerk, but I don't want to do, <laughs> like, the game just isn't that great, you know. Okay. Like, oh, yeah, that's, you're literally just copying, you know, this or X or whatever. Right. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to do it. You know, I want to make sure you've come up with something that's cool and creative and that I can trust that, um, you know, that it's going to be a good product. It's not just going to be, you know, you know, art, but it'll be a really fun game as well. And so I do like to see the game or, or yeah. at least have a breakdown of it. I think the um, the key takeaway that I've heard, you know, throughout our whole conversation has been, you know, collaboration, that it's, you know, it's both working on this thing together. And it's definitely the relationship you and Tim have, obviously, you know, I, and I think that that's, this isn't a person you bring in late in the game. This is a person who kind of needs to be there around a little bit during the whole process so that they get the flavor and the feel and, and hopefully the passion that you have for the project too. Right. Yeah. And, and that's just really important. I think, you know, I, I, uh, you know, like, like we were saying a little bit earlier, my art is going to be, you know, kind of the, the frosting on this cake. It's going to be the first thing that people see. Right. And so I, I want to be involved for, you know, as much as I can, you know, tell me about it. If things change or, you know, if, if, you know, game mechanics change or whatever, you know, keep me, keep me up on that. Let me know how I was going and what's going on. Yeah. I think so. in this day and age, the art is, and I think it's why we're kind of gravitating towards, you know, aesthetics. Like for instance, I'll buy anything What's Your Game ever makes. Now, granted, their art direction is very, very bland. It's very boring, but I, I know it's going to be informative. It's going to be consistent. I know what I'm getting out of the project. It's not, 
anything crazy. And I think that, you know, visuality sells games, whether it's a box on a shelf, whether it's, you know, being able to understand what that game does by looking at the cover or flipping it around in the back. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's what projects you're generally associated with. If you're generally passionate about projects and you only take on ones that fit your your passion and your aesthetic, then chances are, well, if he feels that way, when he goes and he puts his art in another game, I'm probably going to like that too, because I already yeah. like all the other stuff. So it kind of makes sense, I guess, when we think yeah. about the yeah. whole picture. <laughs> and pretty boxes sell, you know, what can you say? <laughs> they, they do, you know, we put a lot of thought into our boxes, you know, whether it's the, the size and how the box is laid out, we put a lot of thought into that. So yeah, and I love that when you can take a box and make it part of the game, you know, like even even as something as simple as, you know, the helipad on the Burgle Bros, you know, it's just, you know, something as simple as that just kind of, it, it kind of doesn't have to sit on the chair during the game, you know, or off the table. You can actually break it out. Yeah, everything is part of the game. Sab and sabotage, that's just exactly what it's going to be. And, you know, I, I appreciate the thought put into making the box, you know, stylized and interesting even if it's not a part of the game like the fact that you're caring about the box in in, in the mm -hmm. industry now so there's so much standardization where you get that like ticket to ride box no matter yep. no matter what you're putting inside i appreciate that you're customizing right. the box to fit the game that's a that's a little extra touch that like matters to me yeah we like it we, we want it to look good on the shelf when it's just sitting on you you know people have awesome game shelves nowadays we want it to right. look cool on the shelf Absolutely. I love having a little vignette of all one publisher sitting there. I'm also mm -hmm. very fortunate that that my vignette is also signed by everybody involved in the project, <laughs> which is a, a nice little a nice little touch. But I, I love that when there's that consistency of art style box, et cetera, just it's yeah. it, it makes a difference. Absolutely. Cool. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I, I, I love this. I could talk all night about art and games, and it's just, it, I find it utterly amazing because, well, if you couldn't tell, I wanted to be an artist when I grew up. Um, but it's it's definitely interesting to learn some of the um, the business side because it's not all, you know, pretty paintings and things. It's, it's a lot of hard work, and it's a lot of you know, grunt work. Sometimes making plates is not the most fun thing in the world. I'm sure it's monotonous and yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it is. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's get on to something fun because I think Dan set us up for a little game tonight. So we're going to pause for a quick break, come back and we'll play that. So we'll be right back with Ryan playing a quick game after this. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying the show. Real quick, I just wanted to take a moment to let you know a few things about us. Number one is we have a Pod Pledge page. Now on there, you can donate any amount, uh, monthly, weekly, daily, whatever, and any of that goes directly to support the show, build the sets, better equipment, and all those things. I'm not trying to get rich. I'm not trying to quit my day job. It just anything helps. Number two is please check out our social media. If you're not following us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, please do so. We definitely interact with our people a lot on there because uh, we want you guys to be part of this show. Also, be sure to subscribe to YouTube. You know that little red button down there? Make sure you're clicking that and also do the bell icon so that you can get notified whenever we post a video. Once, twice, maybe three times a week. Lastly, please be sure to tell your friends. Whether you retweet something, whether you go out and you tell them about the channel, show them a show, anything you can do to get the word out, we would greatly appreciate it. So that's it. I'm now gonna return you to your regularly scheduled program. Operators are standing by. It's game time. All right, welcome back. It's gonna be game time. Dan is going to tell us in a second exactly what Ryan and I are going to be playing because I so I used to always take care of the games but you know now that I have Dan he takes care of all the games which is uh it's kind of cool and frightening all at the same time so Dan what exactly are we going to be playing tonight I try to keep you guessing okay so this is going to be a game of Muse 
by okay. Jordan Sorensen. Um, and this is a game in which we will we'll be playing the co-op version of this. It's going to be played as a team versus team or a co-op game. So we'll mm-hmm. be playing where we are trying to get the other members of our team to successfully guess which piece of art that we're referring to. Okay. So um, I will put six pieces of art up on the screen. We will, in turn, each of us will take a turn as a clue giver. We'll randomly determine one of those pieces of art that we're trying to get our teammates to guess. We will then, as the muse, have to give our clue based on the inspiration. I will draw two inspiration cards. Hence the uh, muse. Indeed. I will read both of those out. They will describe the form that your clue has to take. Okay. Um, the clue giver will choose from those two, let us know which of the two inspirations has been chosen, and then give the clue based on that you know, restriction. Um, then the people, the two people who are not the clue giver will try to guess which of the six pieces of art they're referring to, and we'll see if we're right or wrong. Sounds pretty straightforward. Uh, you on board with that, right? we do it. I'm on board. Let's do it. All right. So if um, one of us needs to see the artwork again, Dan will put it up for a little bit. Feel free to ask because it's okay. going to be on screen for a bit, and if you forget or you need a little guidance, feel free to ask, and we'll pop it back up and go from there sounds like fun oh it absolutely sounds like fun okay are we ready for uh for number one sure okay so here are the pieces of art i know which of these six i need to get everyone to guess all right i have drawn two inspiration cards the Mm -hmm. first says name a non-fictional body part and the second says name a published book okay um, okay, I will choose name a published book, and okay. I will say I Robot. Uh, uh, let's see. Well, that's, I Robot. Uh, that's gotta be number one, right? Yeah, it kind of looks a little like the tank, and it kind of has that Asimov feel to it. I might go with that. Yeah, I can't really see what what's going on in number six. Number six just kind of looks like a uh, lantern festival with a church steeple and a parachute. Church steeple. Okay. No, not that one. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I like one as well. Okay. Number one. That's the final answer. Guess is number one. I think so. Correct. And uh, at least we start off pretty easy. We'll see if uh, yeah it stays that convenient from here on out. But you know, it's not going to. Things never go as we plan. Based on based on the games I've run to date, it, it's rarely that smooth. <laughs> this is fair. This is fair. Okay. All right. So we're doing the second one now. Here are our pieces of art. Chris, or I'm sorry, Ryan. Why don't you? Ryan, so this I is can... Ryan. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you decide which of these silently decide which of these six you're trying to get us to guess, and and I will give you your two inspirations that you can choose from. First. Okay. Make yeah, a ahead. sound effect without using words Oops, sorry. or mm. second okay. name a non-fictional article of clothing <laughs> sound effect without using words or an article of clothing non-fictional yeah. article a non real <laughs> article. Yeah, I, I don't know that, how much of a restriction that is i don't know <laughs> yeah. everything's real at some point i think given what i've seen at comic cons <laughs> Okay, so clothes or a sound. Let me see the pictures again. Here they are. Okay. Uh, I, or for this one, I think I'm going to have to go with the sound effect. Okay. okay. Make a sound effect. Okay. <clears throat> you ready? Oh, yep. yeah. <laughs> oh. If that doesn't help you get it, what's oh. wrong with you? <laughs> I'm so glad that you chose sound effect. That's so much more interesting. <laughs> I am too, because I kind of think now I need to leave this in the audio version. Um, I don't know, Maybe Dan. What the- are you thinking? Well, there is uh, number three has a lot of rushing water. I did. I, he- I did hear some 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 liquid sounds there. Right. Right. Was- the the only. It, it, it could be a very bad cat, which is what's <laughs> that's making me worry about number six. Um, but I I think I'm I'm inclined to agree with the uh, 
the hobbit town that's precariously built on the edge of a waterfall <laughs> horrible location uh, yeah that's not i yeah that's not really given the rate of water erosion it might be safe but i i'm not sure i think that it was chosen because it's scenic i think uh okay so so we are guessing uh number three number three what do you think you go with that dan oh yeah all, all right. right we're going with three all right correct number three right. it is Oh, we are Perfect. two for two. My part. I'm much better at co-op, apparently. <laughs> I don't lose as often. Ah, uh, so we'll make sure that this <laughs> we is say the that last, now. This is the last co-op game I bring to the table, is what I'm hearing right here. Nah, so. nah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so are you ready for your turn? Bring it on. All right. All right. Here are your pieces of art to choose from. Randomly decide amongst those, and I will le read your inspirations. So your choices are, name a game released in the last 20 years. Okay. That covers almost the whole history of designer games. But Or, or name a non-fictional piece of furniture. So no double-decker couches. That's, that's piece of furniture. Piece or... of furniture or a game. That is a, that is a tighter restriction, I think, than either Ryan or I had to suffer under. You know, you... That's... Yeah. Yeah. Um... Ooh. Um, hmm. Okay. So I think I'm going to have to go with a non-fictional piece of furniture. Yeah, you're right, Dan. Um, I'm going to go with a lamp. A lamp. That's a piece of furniture, right? I mean, that's a, that's a, it's a piece of decor. <laughs> yeah. I could buy it. I can buy that at a furniture store. That, that's fair. I, I think, I don't know exactly where the line ends for furniture. So it's, it's, it's like near the edge. I don't know something which something side it's on, but we'll take yeah. it. I feel like furniture implies something you sit on or your, like your body is on it in some way. <laughs> so, so a floor lamp would be different than say a regular lamp. Um, hmm. The judges, will go with it. the judges have decided to allow it, and we'll, we'll okay. let the court of public opinion decide. Well, you know, it's my show. Right. I get to do these things. <laughs> judge, jury, executioner. I am, I am Judge Dredd when it comes to this, I guess. Okay. So that said, we, we still have a position here. because Yeah, uh, you still have to figure it out. Right. Um, so. I didn't make your life I'm, easy. Th there are, in no. fact, no lamps pictured in any of these. Uh... No, that'd be a little easy. <laughs> Now, my guess is it's, you know, I'm, I'm going to make this easy on us. I think it's either one, three, or four. And now we have a 50-50 chance. Really? Right? I mean, we've broken it down that, to that three. That math makes sense. Okay. So, and and I, 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 I'm inclined to think it's not four, only in so far as bed would have been a really obvious piece of furniture if uh, yeah, that's good thinking. Um, good thinking. If you were taking number four. So, so we think one or three have a lamp. My to first them. instinct was one, only because, you know, there's a big fat light in it. But, uh, Three could be it. The three the light also coming is, 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 has an eerie light happening inside of a house. It so. does. Oh, man. That might be more what you think of when you think of a lamp. You know, it's not, its light is not all consuming and bright like a sun, but it's, you know, yeah. smaller, the dark. What, but I do see where you're at with one. One almost sort of visually resembles that, like House of Cards sort it of does. comes off mm -hmm. like a lamp. Like, a, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Man, one or gut, three yeah I, I agree it's down to those my gut says three but i will go with uh with whatever you're i'll go with three I, I can see three all right three is our uh, is our guess three is correct oh all right we are so three for three three for three <laughs> maybe it's because i just played villainous last night but all I could see was the mouth of the Cave of Wonders when I saw that. And that's the one that... Oh, the, it's the genie's lamp here? That yes. <laughs> yes. Well, we got lucky because we were not on that vibe. You were not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how I could work a piece of furniture. And I haven't played a game outside of like Roller Coaster Tycoon or Civ in the last 20 years. Or Diablo for that matter. Maybe Diablo. That might Board games count. Like that was. Oh, see, I was um, thinking video games. 
See, the uh, the card, I don't know how, how clear this will be, the card actually even is like meeple, a meeple. themed. So I've, I would uh -huh. missed out, by the way. Muse is a very, you know, you can see the, the visual impact of the game with all of the art cards that we're looking at. But all the inspiration cards come off like constellations, too. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. And, uh, and yes, this is a meeple right. constellation. Well, hey, so. I'm a results guy, so... <laughs> We got there, so it doesn't matter how. Uh... <laughs> we're good. We're good. I think we're good for one more round. This is fun. I like this. Excellent. Uh, I'm, I'm, this out. I'm jealous. Uh, so it's uh, Quick Simple Fun Games is the publisher. Okay. And Jordan Sorensen is the, I, I, I imagine, both designer and artist. He's the only one credited on it. All right. Good job, uh, Jordan. I like this. Yeah. Um, I'm jealous, by the way, that you've played uh, Villainous. It's a, it's a very, there's a high sex appeal factor in that game. I want to, uh, want to check it out. Well, if we get done early enough. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So it's back to me. It's time back for to me you. To give a uh, give a clue. I am randomly determining a picture. Oh, from the following, by the way, I should share that with. Share that with our home. audience. All, All right. right. And I have to name a non-fictional building structure or monument, or say any number. So real quick, Ryan, I have to know: would would this be? So this this whole like Dixit Mysterium vibe of wackadoodle fantastical dream art, would you have uh -huh. any desire whatsoever to do some of this work? In that style? Yeah. Uh, like they came no. to you and said, "You can do a round of Dixit cards." Would you be like, "No, I'm not having any of that." <laughs> Like I, I would love to do, you know, some some fantasy based stuff, but it would have to kind of be. Uh, I, I would want the style to be very different. Okay, so, I was just curious because you know. I, I always wondered about that because it's always so it's very specific almost. Yeah, yeah, it, it'd be fun to do, but I would just want it to look so different than, you know, the countless other versions that there are. Fair I mean, enough. It's, it's all, yeah. Okay. Unpause. Sorry, Dan. I'm right. <laughs> no, I was no, just no, looking no, at those, no. and I'm like, there, there's some really beautiful ones, but yeah, oh, yeah there they're is, beautiful. There is a trippiness that seems to be inherent in the genre. That, uh, yes, yes. I think you um, need some mushrooms in your life. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to choose the inspiration of say any number. Okay, and, and I guess you can't choose one to six. <laughs> 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 oh, my number will be a number a single digit number but but it will not be the number of, on the uh, okay it, it is not what i'm okay. going for i'm not cheating <laughs> um, but i will say the number three okay well that's that's got to be number five right there right well it could also Wait. be number four because that's the number of palm trees oh, and it three. also could be number six because that's the number on the oh, rad right. symbol and the eyes Right. Oh, man. <laughs> I was hoping Everyone you didn't say four. three. In retrospect, a very poor clue. <laughs> <laughs> I regret trying to help everything. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, I think that I think the four is the most obvious three with, with the trees. Yeah, Although, I'm inclined to it almost because it looks like a hand and the number three coming out of the hand. Yeah. Let's go four. Yeah, I'm with you. We're going to go four, despite this awesome clue. Yeah, I am. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like when you're playing Spyfall, or not Spyfall, when you're playing code names, and you say something and then realize that the assassin word also fit the clue you just gave. Yeah, it fit, it fit your three things perfectly, and then also this other thing. Happens yeah. to be a really terrible. It yeah, happens. Um, yeah, this wasn't so good. Uh, so no, it wasn't number four, or, oh, or number man. five, or, or number six. <laughs> there are three flamingos in the uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Whatever those cranes or cranes? Sure. Those, those. Really? So the only one we didn't mention with three. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, I didn't even see three there. There's there like covering each other up kind of yep huh. okay so uh, yeah I'm, I, I apologize for that um do we do we want to do one last one for uh, for chris to salvage or for ryan to salvage our uh, oh yeah let's do it oh yeah no we we have we can do two more yeah okay all right 
All right, next one is this set of lovely pictures. If Ryan will determine which of these right. we are trying to guess. Uh, and I will supply okay. some possible inspirations. Name all right, a, I got it. All right. Name a non-fictional food or dish. Or name a non-fictional tool. The, the recurring presence of non-fictional in there really takes away from the way those scan but yeah a food or dish <laughs> or a tool it really kind of kind of narrows the scope a bit doesn't it okay um i think that i have to go with a food or dish all right and uh let's see that food is going to be um milk I mean, it's a drink, but it's food too. Milk. Oh, it's food, yeah. Oh, that I definitely gotta go three then. Because the cats love milk. Kitties love milk. I mean, they're they're kind of fighting, but I still think a milk would calm that all down. Maybe they're gambling for milk in that poker game of. Maybe, milk. maybe that's the buy-in is a pint. Unless it's the aliens in the Milky Way. Hmm. <laughs> That's, that's, <laughs> that seems that seems like a stretch. It does, because you could have gone like candy bar or something if you went that road. No, I, I'm I'm liking three, Dan. Yeah, I don't. See In this case, I like three. When you know, <laughs> when it's not, it's my, not like my four out of six. <laughs> um, yeah, and and I do not see any other strong candidates for milk in this mix. That's the. Uh... No, you know, there's 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 some white froth in five, but that would really be a stretch. No, no, so, he was pretty sure about the milk. I think that was right out of the gate. All right, so I, I'm comfortable with this. I, I, I see right. nothing better, so we will go with number three. Correct. All right. Outstanding. There Four we go. Five. See, everyone, everyone can do this except me. That's it. Well, <laughs> you know, you can't be great at everything, Dad. <laughs> or or anything. All right. Um. Should we do? Uh, should we wrap it up and for an even six of these? And uh, we got yeah. it. We might as All well right. use it. All right. Please determine which of these six pictures that you need us to guess. All right. Rolling my blue peg, pink peg die. All right. All right. You are going to either name an insect. It will not surprise you that it needs to be a, a non-fictional insect. Non-fictional insect. <laughs> or name a color of the rainbow. An oh. insect or a color of the rainbow. Really? All right. Um, so I'm going to go with insect. And it's going to be a dung beetle. <laughs> dung beetle. If nothing else, this game was a success because it got us to... to Reference dung beetles. On right. I mean, yeah, so my, it wasn't going to this happen. This is my And any game that makes you reference a dung beetle cannot be that bad. Uh, I don't know. I do not see any dung. No, I, I don't see any dung, nor do I see any beetle. Um, I don't really see anything that makes me feel like I'm in dung or that is inspired by dung. Uh, so yeah, there's nothing trashy here. Now dung beetles like roll up like balls of dung. Like that's what they they do, right? Is that is that okay, akin to right? whatever the the, sh the shovel gentleman is doing down in number six? I don't I don't know. So is he just? I'm just trying to see this picture clearly. He's tiny, and there's someone gigantic behind him. Correct? Yes. He appears to be so, some sort of beach gnome. I don't know what's going on. It's very, it's very Gulliver's <laughs> Travels right there. Okay. But either way, you know, I guess it could be, you know, from the viewpoint of a dung beetle, if a little kid was coming up behind him. I really hate that, you know, when, you, when you're the clue giver, you fixate on a thing or a thought path or it's just, yeah. Yeah. It seemed obvious the connection was clear in your head. And then... it, it will be in yours, but I mean, it's no number yeah. three, but it's. Uh... You did say it with a, a certain degree of certainty, so it seems to make sense for you. 
It does. I can't tell what's going on in the background of number one from the picture. What's going on behind? What is that? So there's a, a cedar boy with a big old backpack on, and he has a, a staff. Oh, it's a backpack. Some treasure. Yeah, yeah. He has his, and his backpack is extensive. It, it, it seems to be okay. like a like yeah. cedar's pack. Um, I don't see any. It has some browns in it. That's what that one's got going for it. Um. um I, I guess for me, six is probably the best guess. Got any other any other thoughts? Yeah, I was trying to see if anything looked like like there was a bad smell going on, but I don't I don't get that mm -hmm. um, from anything. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't have anything better. So, uh, are we ready? Are we? Are we? I'm we're clearly not feeling confident, but uh, no, no, you're not. No, for, you're not. for lack of better, no, that's options, fair. That's in fair. Interest, in the interest of time, we are going with number six. All right. Well, actually, it was number two. Oh. And if you pull up number two, yeah. and you look in the top left corner, what is that? I don't know. That's an outhouse. Ah. I... Uh... Okay. Oh my goodness! <laughs> That's what I had to work with. <laughs> I don't know what. I, so, what were my choices? Insect or Insect like there was a hummingbird, but or color of the rainbow that which... literally has every color of the rainbow in it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think all would work as an option. <laughs> yeah, and any color you picked is probably present elsewhere too. So. Yeah, so the, I was going to say fly, but I think that was a little too generic. So I wanted to try and clue you in. But you didn't. You never saw the. You never saw the uh, outhouse, so you can't really make that happen. It's a valiant effort, and I've seen the outhouse. Yeah. And in retrospect, made more sense than three ever did. So there was no point uh -huh. in which that looked like yes. a good clue. So you know, that's a, <laughs> we're gonna miss twice. So yeah. <laughs> this you, is true. So Ryan, if somebody were to say want to find some of your artwork or anything like that where would they find you uh you know right now probably if you want to find me on instagram okay. uh, i'm on instagram at goldsbury ryan i'm also you know you can also find me at twitter which you see at the bottom there um those are the best places to find me outstanding and of course if you just do a quick search we'll find your etsy shop and you can down you know you can get prints and things from the games and all that you've done in the past as well as cons like go seek out tim spower's booth as well right we're, we're at most of the cons uh pax and gen con we're at a lot of them are you coming to pax U this year uh i am awesome uh well more than likely i will be at uh pax prime here in a couple of few weeks is that coming up okay yeah i think yeah, it's soon be. yeah awesome. well we'll have to make sure to hang out again hopefully you know clay gets it together and we're close to each other again that was awfully convenient last time yeah. so <laughs> yeah. awesome well thanks so much for making time for being on the show thanks for you know providing the artwork of the show i mean that you know the, the characters of me, I love, and uh, I have special plans for them in the future, I might add. And uh, chances sure. are you're going to be doing this guy over here soon and do a picture for him soon because I, you know, he's obviously sticking around. So I guess we have to make him official. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Let me know what you need. Absolutely. <laughs> so thanks for being on. Thank you, Dan, for that yeah. game. And thank you at home for watching. So be sure to enjoy the art the next time you game all night. Game All Night is proud to be sponsored by Game Toppers. Check them out at GameToppersLLC.com. Upgrading your gaming experience. Well, that's a wrap. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed our efforts at Comedy and Fun, please support us on PodPledge. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, don't forget to engage with us on Board Game Geek Guild 3134. You can also check us out on our website, GameAllNightShow.com. This show has been made possible through supporters like these. Angry Octopus. You know, now that I have Dan, he takes care of all the games, which is, uh, it's kind of cool and frightening all at the same time.
Ooh, burns, burns. Guess dung beetles. Dung beetle. Dung beetle. Outhouse, you know, not really relevant. I mean, I don't know whatever else a door with a half moon on it and a small box shape is, but whatever, whatever. It's okay. It's no number three, which qualifies for 66% of the answers, but. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs>